We live in the age of the internet of things. People keep, for better or worse, incessantly digitizing the private domain. So more devices than ever before can be connected, customized, and programmed to serve the curiosity or the convenience of the user. This has resulted in an explosion of devices being connected to the internet, many of which come with little to no out-of-the-box security protocols, weak default credentials, or are built upon an outdated operating system with numerous known vulnerabilities. And attacks against your home entertainment system or your thermostat are bad, but these days, an entirely new class of device is being opened up to the web. And it's one that literally determines whether its user lives or dies. More and more frequently, life-sustaining implanted medical devices are being exposed to the internet. A supposed advancement that actually often leaves them totally vulnerable. Yep, it's possible to hack a pacemaker embedded in a person. Forget PewDiePie printer pranks and botnets of light bulbs. Someone 50 feet away could stop your heart with a laptop. Anything internet connected is vulnerable. And today we're gonna talk about one of the most dire examples hacking hospital devices. But we're not gonna talk about how it could happen in the future. This is not theoretical. You should know before we even get started, we are talking about this because it is happening now. If you don't know who Barnaby Jack is, it's about time you learned. Barnaby Jack was a hacker, cybersecurity researcher, and programmer. Known for his creativity and ingenious techniques that allowed him to exploit even the most seemingly secure of devices. His most famous exploit was likely his 2010 presentation at Black Hat, where he demonstrated what he called jackpotting. His ability through kinetic or totally wireless attacks to hack the operating systems governing ATMs, usually Windows, and cause the machines to suddenly begin ejecting all their cash. Jack performed this live on stage at Black Hat and it literally changed the hacking world. Not just because it drew so much attention to the vulnerabilities he was exploiting, go look it up to see in depth, but hint, it involves default passwords. But also because it opened up a new avenue of hackable things. This means we need to shift our thinking about connectivity and functionality from one seeking convenience to one seeking security. However, before diving deeper into that, I want to take a moment to remind us that from a programming perspective, revelations like this remind us that with enough abstraction, any challenge can be conceptualized, any problem can be tackled, and false laws can be overcome. So long as we continue to question rather than blindly accept, we will always be able to do the impossible. Such is Jack's legacy and I hope we can honor it. Barnaby Jack died in 2013 at just 35 years old. An inspiration to the community, his loss has been felt widely and he will not be forgotten. Before he went, he left us with some pretty incredible inklings about hacks he'd accomplished. Oh yeah, the ATMs? were just the beginning. As early as 2011, Jack demonstrated a hack on an embedded medical device. He hacked the insulin pump of a friend of his live on stage in Las Vegas. By interfacing with the pump's high gain antenna, he scraped the pump's serial number, which enabled him to gain control over its functionality. On his friend, of course, he only demonstrated his ability to take over the pump. However, on a demo pump sitting on stage safely outside of any actual real human bodies, he demonstrated repeatedly that he could force the pump to deliver its maximum dose of insulin until its entire reserve was emptied, a quantity high enough to kill any user several times over. Jack was able to do all of this from over 90 meters away. The power this implies is absolutely terrifying, but Jack wasn't using it to demonstrate how he would commit a murder. At the time a McAfee researcher, Jack used his presentation as a call to action for medical device manufacturers. He clearly outlined the most major point I'm trying to make here. Medical device manufacturers aren't thinking about cybersecurity, and they need to be. The same type of vulnerability that lets an all too helpful printer spit out PewDiePie propaganda cannot be what results in the death of a diabetic. And it's not just insulin pumps. In 2012, Barnaby Jack demonstrated the ability to hack a victim's pacemaker. He described this hack as being even easier than some Hollywood film would make it seem, saying, you don't even need a serial number. He died a week before he was set to demonstrate hacking 
making heart implants at Black Hat in 2013. The outline of his talk showed that he found a way to send a heart-stopping shock to a patient from over 30 feet away. And let's not make it sound like Barnaby Jack is like somehow the only person capable of doing this. If we know anything from the grand tradition of cybersecurity, it's that whatever blue team has, red team has meaner. This is not about the kind of people interested in exploiting these vulnerabilities. This is about the companies manufacturing these devices in the first place. My team at Grizzly Shield has personally had to try and secure medical devices that were running Windows XP. Real actual human lives are being trusted to an operating system that literally doesn't get patches anymore. And these devices are getting FDA approved. Both implanted medical devices or IMDs and apps that control any medical devices, implants or otherwise, are subject to FDA approval. But despite the fact that Barnaby Jack demonstrated insulin pump hacking in 2011, the FDA approval guidelines surrounding security don't seem to have evolved into the robust protections we need. And by that, I mean there's hardly any regulations at all. The FDA can only recommend that the devices be secure, but they're really only there to certify if they work from a medical perspective. Which even in my mind is still confusing because like in the same way that untested code doesn't run, right? I think we can all agree that um, if we know a pacemaker can be hacked to kill you when it's supposed to be keeping you safe, um, that would fall in the category of uh, not not running the way it says it does. Unless I'm missing the deliberately poisonous insulin pump advertising. In which case, I have some demographic questions. But anyway, that means it is medical organizations who need to be taking the vulnerability of their devices into consideration. Since the devices themselves don't seem to be doing it. And they are continuously being incentivized to, but that in no way guarantees that they actually are. HIPAA federal requirements have recently changed to encourage higher security for medical providers. Requiring encryption, audits, a reliable means of data authentication, i.e you need to be sure that your records haven't been hacked and altered and you need a way to prove it. Transmission security, i.e. the way you send and receive information cannot be intercepted or interfered with. And higher fines should your security policies not meet these standards. However, HIPAA regulations try to be flexible and allow many different options for the different organizations trying to comply, which can lead to miscommunications and hospitals slipping through the cracks. Most important to remember, however, is that the medical devices themselves do not fall under HIPAA regulations and instead, therefore, remain in the highly imperfect domain of the FDA. Basically, the buck isn't stopping anywhere. Not stopping at the device manufacturers because the FDA doesn't adequately incentivize them. And because once they've built all their software on one operating system, they decide it's too much of a hassle to refactor. Despite the fact that this operating system is, by definition, not monitored, not supported, and not updated. Also, I, I take personal issue with this as a software developer who has had too many times in the middle of a project update my code that I had written to accommodate some update that happened to like all of our machines just midway because Apple decided they needed to push something out. It is part of my job, our jobs, to update code according to the platforms that it is expected to run on. So it absolutely boggles my mind that the same standard is somehow not applying to software that is meant to literally keep people alive. But like, Okay, it's not stopping at the hospitals because while they may follow some HIPAA regulations, they may do so improperly. But more than that, their priority is, as it should be, treating patients. So because of that, they may engage in practices like sharing passwords between doctors and nurses. They may do this with good intentions, like they want to speed up workflows in order to see more patients. My point is that that's not how they were trained to think, right? So they're going to trust the devices that were given to them by the FDA that were approved to be medically safe would be safe, you know, from hacking too, because you you would just assume that. In other words, they're expecting the buck to stop at the FDA, which we know it does not. Where does the buck stop now? What does that even mean? Is it a deer or like a dollar? I'm gonna look this up. Where does the buck stops now come from? Buck stops now is a phrase that was popularized by US President Harry S. Truman, who kept a sign with that phrase on his desk in the Oval Office. The phrase refers to the notion that the president has to make decisions and accept ultimate but what is the buck? Oh. The phrase is based on the metaphorical expression passing the buck, derived from poker gameplay that came to mean passing blame or absolving oneself of responsibility or concern by denying authority or jurisdiction over a given matter. Interesting. Poker, I guess. All right. Nice. We learned. Expanded privacy laws imminent now that Prop 24 is passed. Go watch that video if you want to know what that means for us. Are going to mean, or hopefully going to mean, more audits for businesses tasked with guarding personal identifiable information or personal health information. To quote Omar Barron of the Grizzly team, Winter, I mean, 
audits are coming. The main thing though is that because of the information they store and the access they have, hospitals have become a huge target for attacks. The FBI warned like a couple weeks ago that US hospitals were under imminent threat of attack, which is especially relevant now during the COVID-19 crisis. It's not a question of if, it's a question of how bad. This September, all 250 facilities of the Universal Health Services hospital chain were brought to their knees by a cyber attack. Practitioners had to revert to pencil and paper record keeping as lab devices and vital signs monitoring equipment failed. That same month, we recorded the first known ransomware related death. In Germany, an IT system failure forced the reroute of a critically ill patient to a hospital in a different city. That patient later died. The cyber attacks on hospitals are approaching a pandemic of of their own. With ransom demands of over $10 million per target and dark web chats discussing plans against over 400 hospitals, clinics, and other medical facilities, I need you to understand that none of this is theoretical. These attacks are leveraging a few new strains of malware, Ryuk and Conti, which are distributed using the Windows attacking loaders, also known as zombie computers, TrickBot and Bizarre Loader. TrickBot began life as a banking trojan descended from Dyer. It's a form of malware often used by the Russian government and Russian gangs that has now grown to offer many more services than just bank compromise, including credential harvesting, mail exfiltration, crypto mining, point of sale data exfiltration, and of course, the deployment of such malware as Ryuk and Conti. Advanced trickbot modules called Anchor were developed to use against high profile targets such as, oh, I don't know, large corporations. These modules use Anchor DNS, a backdoor that forces the victim's computer to communicate with the command and control servers set up by the bad guys through domain namespace tunneling. Using this tunneling, the exfiltrated data and other communications from the bad guy's machine to the victim's machine will blend in with legitimate DNS traffic. It's called anchor DNS after a string left once the communications have been decrypted. This malware has some pretty recognizable configuration files that it creates. Like it literally initializes a readme. And if you're interested, you should check out the full write-up. I have the link in the description below. But essentially, the goal of this malware is to steal and encrypt data, brick computers, sometimes demand ransoms to get it back, but all in all, to create chaos and sow fear in a time when the outside world already perceives America as weak and vulnerable. And yes, TrickBot is widely attributed to Russia, but Ryuk is available to any group willing to pay its architects a cut. We can't be sure who's behind this. We need to secure ourselves. There exists a real and dangerous disconnect between many industries in the digital era. It's not just medicine. It's like, People either can't understand or refuse to accept the proliferation of devices into our lives and the need to adjust the way we live accordingly. We have entered a time where the FDA needs to be able to do cybersecurity analysis because the hackability of a medical device is certainly a major concern when you say you're evaluating the overall safety. The defenders cannot keep living so far behind the attackers. Not when a new way to expose devices to hacking gets invented every day. Not when real, actual human lives lives are at stake. Let me know in the comments the craziest internet connected thing you've ever encountered. I'd like do a thought trace for me on ways it might be vulnerable. Also, you all know by now, but this video is made in partnership with Grizzly Information Security Solutions. When your medical devices get sick, they are the cure. And if you came from TikTok or the Discord server, this special hello is for you. I love you guys. Stay safe. Till next time. I leave my window open, pretend you come inside, can't fix what is in From a defense perspective, this means we need to think, shift our thinking. From a defense perspective, this means we need to, this means we need to think, oh my God. This means we need to shift. <laughs> Why can't I say this word? Shift, bro. From a defensive perspective, this means we need to th shift. I keep trying to say think before I say shift. This means we need to shift our thinking. I got so excited that I said it that I just stopped. I'm just using that. It's gonna cut in the middle of a sentence. So. Raymond, why do you always start these things at midnight? It's 12.30 in the morning. But you stayed for the cutscene, hello. You guys who stayed for the cutscenes, you know that you're my favorites, right? That's a real bot, serious. And this is not a joke, this is not a joke. Yep, I started filming this at 12.24 in the morning because I make good choices. So maybe to show me that you watch the cutscene, comment whatever time it is where you are. And like where you are, because I want to know where you're from, because you guys are always from like cool places that I wish I could go. But it's COVID. So 
Tell me about the place that you're from so I can pretend that I'm there. 